Good evening, brothers and sisters. Um, If you have your Bibles tonight, open them to Philippians chapter 2, continuing with a study of the book of Philippians. We are in verse 12 through to verse 16 tonight. Philippians 2, verse 12 through to 16. me pray for us and we will look at God's word. Dear God, we thank you for the hope that we have in you. And we want to thank you that tonight we could just be brought close to you even through through worship as we sang about your holiness. May it not just be what we sing, but may it be what we live as well. I pray as we look at the passage before us tonight, seeking to be sanctified by your power, that holiness will be the pattern of our lives. I therefore pray that you would use me to deliver this message to your beloved church, bought with the prize of the blood, that the saints in Christ will obey the truth so that Christ will be glorified. This is what we ask in his name. Amen. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 through to verse 16. The title of this message tonight is Simply sanctifying obedience. A sanctifying obedience is what we're going to see in the text before us. Let me read the text and we'll hear the instructions coming from God's Word tonight. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you appear as lights in the world holding fast the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I will have risen to glory because I did not run in vain nor toil in vain. Have you ever asked, perhaps out of frustration, what God's will for your life is? Perhaps that's the question you ask every year in your resolutions. Perhaps that's the question you ask when you feel like there is a wall before you. What is really God's will for my life? Bookshops abound with books that try to answer this very question for you. But as uh, as you go through book after book, what often puzzles me is the failure by believers to open the divine book that contains all the instructions containing God's will. We ask that question, but we don't take time to go to, go, to go to the Scriptures to find what God's will about our lives really is. But as you open the Scriptures, you find that there are hundreds upon hundreds of imperatives God gives in the Bible, which clearly tells us of His will for our lives. And one of the clearly stated will of God for your life and mine is sanctification. Sanctification. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3 explicitly says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification. If anything, we need to be pursuing a sanctified lifestyle. 
we need to be pursuing holy living, blameless living, pure life before God. Because that is God's will for our lives. Perhaps the well-known commands of Scripture that calls believers to pursue sanctification is found right here in a passage before us in Philippians chapter 2, especially verse 12. The command is, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Work out your salvation is a call to deliberately work out your salvation until it reaches its ultimate end. If we were to simply define sanctification, we could simply say sanctification is what we ought to be, but we are not yet. I think that's a simple definition of sanctification without having to go into the big theological words. Sanctification, if we talk about it, is what we ought to be, but we are not that yet. That's why we are pursuing it. That's why we're seeking to be pure before God, because we haven't reached the ultimate end of our salvation. Now, I want to assume that right now, perhaps you're busy asking, what ought we to be? If sanctification is what we ought to be, and we are not yet, what ought we to be? Good question. This church asks good questions. And I will answer that question for you. A biblical answer is simple. We ought to be like Christ. That's sanctification. We ought to be like Christ. In explaining this sanctification to the believers in Rome, Paul said in Romans 8 verse 29, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. That's the purpose of our salvation. That's the purpose of God's predestination. That's the purpose of everything about us as believers. It's to to, for us to be like Christ, to be conformed to his image. To the Corinthian church, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18, But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. So for Christians, sanctification means being like Jesus. Similarly, in Philippians chapter 2, when Paul commands us to work out our salvation, he is commanding us to be like Christ. Now, I want you to notice that Paul begins Philippians chapter 2, verse 2, with a connecting word, so then, or therefore, in your Bibles. There is a reason for that conjunction there. This conjunction, therefore, or so then, is used by Paul to draw the conclusion from the preceding context, his preceding words, particularly verses 5 through 8. We looked at that passage already on this pulpit, where Paul points Christians to Christ as a model of humility, a virtue needed if the church is to maintain unity. That's the context within which we find our text. We are instructed to have the attitude of Christ in ourselves. And this Christ, Paul says about him, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bond servant and being made in the likeness of men. Verse 8 says, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Philippians chapter 2 verse 12 is an application of this Christology we find in these verses, verses 5 through to 8. Paul draws an application 
based on the obedience modeled by the Lord Jesus Christ as we see there in verse 8. See, Christ did not only model humility for us. He also modeled obedience. And we had this morning from Hebrews 5 verse 8 that although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. Philippians chapter 2, therefore, verse 12, looks back to the obedience modeled by Jesus Christ, and Paul would bring it before us and, and with this, and he's saying, or, or calling us, all believers, to be obedient like Christ. See, obedience is a means of sanctification. Hence the title, Sanctifying Obedience. Sanctifying obedience. God is going to use our obedience to his instructions and to his will to sanctify us. We're not going to say it passively, but we are going to have to engage in working out our salvation if we are going to be sanctified. So from this text before us, we will look at two commands we must obey to be like Christ. And I can assure you that given the time we have, we won't be able to cover both commands tonight. So I'm going to cover the first one, and the next time I come back on the pulpit, I will look at the second command. So we will look at verses 12 and 13 tonight. At this command, we need to obey in order to be like Christ. That's our goal tonight. If anything, the purpose of this message tonight is to help you be like Christ. And to be like Christ, Paul says in verse 12, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That is the command we have before us. Now, grammatically, the imperative verb work out in verse 12 is the main thought of this sentence and even of the entire passage as we will see. Because whatever follows after verse 12 and 13 tries to apply or tries to clarify for us what working out your salvation really looks like. Now the Greek text, if you were to go back to verse 12, construct this sentence different from what we have in our English. Because in our English grammar, we try to clarify or bring the main thought or the main verb closer to the beginning of the text, the Greek text does not do that, and there is a reason for that, and we will find out why the Apostle Paul constructs this sentence the way he does. Literally, the Greek text constructs this Sentence like this. You can just listen to how the wedding goes in this translation. Paul says, Therefore, my beloved, just as always you obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, with fear and trembling, your salvation work out. Perhaps there's a reason why Paul places the instruction at the end of this sentence. The word work out comes at the very end of the sentence. So before dishing out instructions, Paul affirms his love for the church. He commends them for their obedience, acknowledging their consistency in their obedience. That's what we see in the construction of this sentence, beginning with the love that he basically pours out to these believers in that little word, my beloved. Bringing out the commendation to them with that phrase, just as you have always obeyed. And also acknowledging the consistency of this obedience in the words, not only in my presence, but 
in my absence as well. Now you look at that, you say, now what is the purpose of that? I believe the purpose of this construction is that Paul would first begin by encouraging the believers before he could give them the instruction. For the church to obey, we need to first be encouraged. It is always difficult to keep on just taking instructions and instructions where there is no encouragement, where you are never commended, where you are never praised if you are doing well. And the Apostle Paul approaches this passage in that way. Before he could give an instruction, he begins by encouraging this church why they should continue doing what they are doing. So let us look at those words. First, beginning with the encouraging affection Paul shows to this church. Uh, that this church was so dear to Paul is felt right in this affectionate address. My beloved. My beloved. Paul dearly loved and longed for this church. He repeats this affectionate address in chapter 4, verse 1, where he addresses the church as my beloved brethren whom I long to see my joy and my crown. As I was looking at this, I had to stop and think, and I came to conclude that it is lamentable that this affectionate expression has or is busy dying off between the church and its leaders. Leaders no longer think of how to address the church anymore. And I had to stop and ask my wife, I said, just tell me, think of all the pastors who stand on the CBC pulpit and tell me how they address the church. Because you often hear we address the church as you guys, ladies and gentlemen, or church, or often at times we avoid any direct address which unfortunately is replaced by such terminologies like you guys and so on. It looks like a small thing, but it wasn't for the Apostle Paul. When Paul said, my beloved to the church, he meant it. There was that relationship and affection to the church. When we stand on a pulpit and say, beloved, we really need to mean it. When we stand on the pulpit and say, brothers and sisters and friends, we really mean it. Brethren, we really mean it. Because that's who we are. That's actually what the church should be to its leader. And this is what Philipp the Philippian church was to the Apostle Paul. His beloved, the crown. The people he always longed for. Let us learn from the Apostle Paul. Because this affectionate address sets a tone for the command that follows. So the Philippians understood the love that accompanies the command, work out your salvation. It was not just given by a man who likes to dish out exhortations or commands, but it was given by a man who loved the church. And not only the encouraging affection, there is also an encouraging commendation that comes following here. Affection is followed by commendation. Paul helps the church how it should work out its salvation in this passage. And this is how he helps the church. He says to them, just as you always obeyed. That's how they are going to have to work out their salvation. As they, has always, they have always obeyed, they need to continue doing that. You can see now that uh, how working out your salvation ties to obedience. How sanctification is tied to obedience. Work out your salvation just as you have always obeyed. Now this comparative clause tells us that there was a pattern of obedience among the believers at Philippi. In other words, they have been working out their salvation already. And one specific example of their obedience is their participation in the gospel. We've already seen this in chapter 1, verse 3 to 5, where Paul says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, 
always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. There is that pattern of obedience in this beloved. And Paul says to them, I want you to continue that, to continue working out your salvation just as you have always obeyed. That's a commendation. Paul recognizes that obedience exists in this church, and he wants that continue. What an encouragement. But third, we have an encouraging acknowledgement. Not only encouraging affection and encouraging commendation, but there is also an encouraging acknowledgement from Paul. Paul not only commended the church for its obedience, he also acknowledged their consistency in their obedience. There was that pattern, the pattern of obedience and they were consistent in obeying. How do we know this? Notice the words again. Not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. These words modify how they have been obeying. Just as you obeyed. How? Not as in my presence only. They obeyed in Paul's presence and they're continuing to obey much more in, Paul, in his absence. That tells us how and when the Philippian church obeyed. Paul is actually acknowledging and commending the church for not being men pleasers because it's easy to obey in the presence of someone that you respect, like Paul. But they obeyed much more in Paul's absence. That's what we learned that believers obey in the presence and in the absence of people whether your leaders or your fellow Christians are watching or not, you still obey God. In your private life and in your public life, you are the same. Your obedience does not change because obedience is not situational. It is expected all the time and everywhere. It is, its continuity is further emphasized in the present tense of the command, we will see, work out your salvation. Now with the right affectionate tone set, commendation and acknowledgement for their consistent obedience given, believers are now ready to receive an encouraging command. And here it is, work out your salvation. Now, those of you who exercise are familiar with the word work out. I had my work out today. We know what it takes to work out our bodies. Now, I want you to transfer that activity to your sanctification, and you will quickly realize that just like a body, salvation that is not worked out is not going to be profitable. If your body to be in shape needs to be worked out, your salvation as well to reach its ultimate end needs to be worked out. Now, it is clear that salvation here does not refer to justification or else Paul would be advocating for works salvation, a theology he refuted extensively in the books of Romans and Galatians. But by salvation, Paul looks at the sanctification phase of our salvation. Hence, Paul involves our contribution. We know that in justification or regeneration, we contribute nothing. But when it comes to sanctification, we are part of that process or that progress. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 through to 10, actually clarifies this theology well for us, where Paul explains, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. That's verse 8 and 9. That's justification. We contribute nothing. It is by grace. It is the gift of God. I look at 
the change in verse 10, looking at a life after this salvation in verse 8 and 9, Paul writes in verse 10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. God saves us without works, but after salvation, as his workmanship, he expects works. He expects works. That's sanctification. He prepared us beforehand, these works beforehand, so that we would walk in them, so that we would live in them, so that we would work out our salvation. That's sanctification. And every saved believer has to work out his or her salvation. Now, with all that being said as well, it's still, you still see in this, I can hear, those are just words. But how and where and when do I work out this salvation? Praise be to God, because Paul does not give this command in a vacuum. But he gives this within a particular context. And I want you to note that context here. First thing I want you to note is that Paul hasn't left the theme of unity he began addressing in chapter 1, verse 27 yet. He is still continuing with the theme of unity in this letter. And this verses, chapter two, from verses 12, looks back to that. Let me help you see that. Because that's one area where we are to work out our sanctification. I want you to observe some parallel concepts between Philippians 2 verse 12 and chapter 1 verse 27. First, the command, work out your salvation in 2 verse 12, is conceptually parallel to the command in chapter 1 verse 27, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. If working out your salvation is not clear to you, perhaps conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel is much clearer. Live your life in accordance with the gospel. Live your life in par with what the gospel of Christ requires of you. That is holy living. That is a holy conduct. Because the gospel of Christ is holy. They are both, again, these two passages are both given in the context of striving and maintaining for the, the unity of the church. He gives that command in chapter 1, verse 27. And when he gives that command, the goal is that he wants to hear that the church's conduct leads to them standing firm in one spirit and with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Sanctification needs to be applied within our relationships. It is easy to perceive yourself as holy and as someone who's waking out his or her salvation when you're trying to live like a hermit or a monk elsewhere. But your sanctification will be most tested when you are among other people. When you're rubbing shoulders with other sinners. People with different personalities. That's where your salvation needs to be worked out. Second, notice that this passage, or these passages, in these passages, Paul wants the church to obey regardless of his presence or absence. In both passages, in chapter 127 and in chapter 212, Paul makes mention of that. Your obedience should not only be in my presence, but also in my absence. So with that, maintaining unity in the church will happen where believers work out their salvation, which is equal to conducting ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of God. Christ. So if you are asking, how will I know that I'm working out my salvation 
Paul would say to you, let's go back to Christ and see if you are as obedient as He is. Are you as humble as He is? And if that's your claim, that model Christ has set for you is actually to model your life among believers in the church. Are you maintaining unity? Are you being of the same mind? Are you maintaining the same love? Are you pursuing the same goal? Are you seeing yourself being selfless? Are you seeing yourself working more and more for other people's interests? more than working for your own interests? Are you seeing selfishness and pride dying in you? Paul says we are to work out our salvation because in verse 4, that is a problem there. We have a tendency to do things out of selfishness and empty concept. So if we are going to have a proof in our lives that sanctification is taking place, Paul would say, let us see how you are doing in your relationships with other believers. So the truth is we do not have the will nor the ability to obey the command to work out our salvation. Why? Because our hearts are selfish, prideful, prone to look out for our own interests. No wonder Paul says we are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. With fear and trembling because we are weak and disobedient. And our disobedience offends the Holy God. We fear and tremble because we acknowledge our personal inabilities to work out our salvation. We also fear and tremble because we do not always have the desire to obey. See, if sanctification was solely left to us, we would not make even the slightest progress in working our sanctification or our salvation out. But praise be to God, because we can progress in our sanctification. Why? Because we know we have the divine help from God Himself. We can obey as Christ obeyed because of God's divine help. And that's where verse 13 comes in in closing. Paul says, God is at work in you. God is at work in you both to will and to work. It is a fact. Without God, sanctification is impossible. Our work out depends on God's work in us. Verse 13, therefore, is the reason for verse 12. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Why? Because God is at work in you. That's how Paul argues it out. For God is at work in you. And that's a great relief, isn't it? It's a great relief for us because this gives us hope that our salvation is workable with God's divine enablement. Our activity is possible only because of God's activity in our lives. And this is where we clearly see man's responsibility and God's sovereignty. They, they kind of like merging or kissing each other right here at our salvation or sanctification point. Some might say, if God works, why should I work? He will complete his work in me anyway. But that thinking, brothers and sisters, contradicts Scripture and is actually tantamount to disobedience. God's working in us is not suspended because we work. Nor our working suspended because God works. But because God works, we work. His working in us does not suspend our working. No, vice versa. But our working is dependent on God's work. Because He works in us, that should give us the ability and the joy to work out our salvation. So what does God work in us? Let's close with this. This is what God does in us. God sees to it that we will to work. God sees to it that 
we have the desire to work. And he sees to it that we work. That's his job. That's his responsibility. He does not work for us. We still have to work. But he gives us the desire and the ability to accomplish the work. Now let's apply this to our unity context again. Paul says we are to be of the same mind. And our response is, that's difficult and impossible for human beings to be of the same mind. And Paul says, yes, it is difficult and impossible, but because God works the will and the ability in you to do this, you can work this part of your sanctification out. It's possible to be of the same mind because God gives us the desire and the ability to do that. God knows our struggle. With, we, he knows we struggle with selfishness in our relationships. So the injunction, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, is impossible unless God works in us the will to be selfless and humble. And unless He enables us to do uh, nothing from selfishness, we cannot do anything. So the bottom line is we need God from the beginning of our salvation and to its end. Without Him, we can do nothing. Further good news is that God gets His pleasure from His work in us. Notice the end of Philippians 2 verse 13. It says He is doing this. For God is at, is at work in you both to will and to work for His good pleasure. This purpose is consistent with that of Ephesians 1, verse 6, 12, and 14. Salvation's purpose, brothers and sisters, from justification to sanctification to glorification is for or to the praise of the glory of God's glory. That's why God is at work in us. Because He has to get that glory. He takes pleasure in our salvations and in seeing to it that it works to accomplish its purpose because he finds pleasure in that. This is the same confidence Paul expressed in Philippians 1.6 when he said, For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Because God is at work in you, work out your salvation with the assurance that it will be perfected by God himself. Now, that's the first command. Second one will come in the next sermon. But I pray that the Lord will help us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. But remembering this, that he is the one working in us to will and to work. And therefore, we can work out our salvation. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. We thank you for your work in us. Thank you for the glory that you get from our sanctification. And therefore, I pray that we would also find joy in your pleasure, that my sanctification gives God's pleasure. And I pray that, Father, we would work because you are at work. Without you working in us, we cannot work. We have not the ability, not the desire. Because our hearts are prone to wonder and to do what we wish. But we thank you that you direct and guide our hearts. May you help us even in this week to look for those areas, not only in the unity of the believers, but for many other areas in our families, in our workspaces, in in our society, wherever, Lord, we find ourselves, even personally, as we seek to be holy before you, that you would help us to work out this salvation. It is in Christ's name we ask. Amen.